Good morning, and welcome to the services at the Clover Church of Christ. Our regular minister, T.J. Bolin, and his family are on a short vacation, and we wish them safe travels and look forward to them being back with us. T.J. asked myself to and Ron Wilson to fill in while he was gone. Ron was gracious enough to let me present this morning's service and he will be presenting a lesson tonight. I urge you all to come back and to hear him. Ron does a fine job. I would say that Ron's willingness to let me go first was an act of kindness, which leads us into our subject for today, kindness. It seems in today's world, with all of the things that are going on with politics, the pandemic, and so many other subjects, that there seems to be a lack of kindness, particularly in how we discuss our differences. Too often it's sad to see that friends, family, and fellow Christians have to be at each other's throat over differences of opinion, when in fact we are urged to be kind. I think Mark Twain summed up how I feel. Kindness is the language which the deaf can hear and the blind can see which is another way of stating that no matter what your handicap might be, you can always feel kindness. People have said that they may never remember what you said, but they will always remember how you made them feel. So in that case, I would urge us all to be kind. In fact, the scriptures instruct us to be kind in several passages. Ephesians 4.32 is a favorite of mine. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. I would like to begin this morning by sharing with you a little bit of how I spend my summer. Some of you know that I spend every summer out in Colorado near the town of Buena Vista. And I'm fortunate to have a church family there to meet with, much as I do here. And in fact, I love this setting. That is their building. And off in the distance, you can see some of my beloved mountains that I love to climb. In fact, the one in the center there, that peak is Mount Princeton, perhaps my favorite. It's at 14,200 feet. And somehow, when I'm on top of Mount Princeton, I feel closer to heaven. Uh, just a small bit of Whitfield humor there. This is another slide showing the current conditions at Mount Princeton and the Buena Vista Church of Christ. I think that gives you some idea of why I am not there now. It would be very difficult to be climbing Mount Princeton in today's conditions, but it is still very, very beautiful. I actually stay nearby in a small town called Nathrop, and there is a RV park there, Chateau Chaparral, which consists of about 300 units actually, everything from tiny homes to park models, travel trailers, motor homes, all sorts of uh, residences, and there are about 35 people that stay there year round. But it, when we are there on vacation, we put up this tent and that's where we have our meals as a, about 12 to 15 of us. And each morning we have a tradition of gathering together at seven o'clock for coffee. We begin our day with a discussion and solving all the world's problems as people are prone to do. I think you see here some of the young folks that are visiting with us, the old folks haven't arrived yet. In fact, there are so many old folks in Chateau Chaparral that we more commonly refer to it as geezer ghetto. But let me tell you that I'm not here this morning to entertain you with my travel slides. We are here this morning to worship God, and that is our true purpose for being here. So let's move on. That coffee club, though, is similar to us here, and their topics of discussion. I have listed several of the things that often come up in our discussions, and I think you will recognize that many of them are topics here. I would like to point out this morning that as I go through some of these, that I am not here this morning to take a side on any of these issues 
or to change your mind on your opinion about any of these issues. My purpose this morning is to challenge how we talk to each other and how much time we spend talking about these subjects versus spreading the message of Christ, which should be our chief purpose for being here. As I look at this list of topics, one thing seems to be missing. Usually in our topics around the coffee club, in these discussions, I very seldom hear mention of biblical principles. I just hear a lot of opinions and arguing, sometimes rather heated. We're all good friends, so don't worry, we love each other. But still, some of the folks in that group are not Christians, are not believers, and we are not setting a very good example when we discuss in such a fashion. In fact, some of those friends of mine that are non-believers have approached me privately and said, Ralph, it seems to me rather hypocritical the way you folks talk to each other when yet you profess to be Christians that love one another. So you can see that they are noticing how we discuss our topics with one another. But let's get into discussing the discussion around some of these topics and see how it goes. The first one I would like to address is the subject of politics. I'm thinking of a country that has a very conservative party, a very liberal party, and then there was a third party that got disgusted with both of them and thought they were out of bounds and formed their own smaller independent party. But all three parties are concerned about the foreign influences and perhaps interference with our uh, rule of law. No, I'm not talking about the United States. I'm actually talking about the country of Israel back in biblical times. Back then, they had the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Essenes, and of course, they were all concerned with the influence of the Roman government. However, we have some biblical instruction about discussing at end such things as politics. In Titus chapter 3, verse 9, we are instructed to avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. And I think I could probably substitute politics for the law in this particular verse, but it's just a caution not to spend all our time babbling on about the current political conditions. One inconvenient truth, and I will use that term again today, is that God is in control. No matter what our position may be, everyone must submit to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist are instituted by God. So then the one who resists the authority is opposing God's command, and those who oppose it will bring judgment on themselves, found in Romans 13 in verse one and two. So although you may like the outcome or not like the outcome of the 2016 election or the 2020 election, you must remember that God was in control of both elections. And that may be a bitter pill to swallow and hard for us to accept, but the biblical instruction tells us that we must do that. And in our discussions, Let's go back once again to the biblical principle. This time I'm going to move to Colossians 3, verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. So once again, in our discussions, we should be kind, gentle, and patient with one another. Let's move on to another topic. Facebook, one of my favorites, and associated with that, fake news, although that may be on the networks or on Facebook. I found this particular slide interesting. It was on Facebook about three weeks ago, and a gentleman was attempting to prove his point that there was election fraud in Georgia in the recent election because Georgia has a population of 3.7 million 
yet somehow five and a half million votes were cast. Therefore, there must have been fraud in stuffing of the ballot boxes, and he used this slide to prove his point. One slight problem. It was the country of Georgia in Europe that has 3.7 million people. The state of Georgia has 10.6 million people, so it was not surprising at all that five and a half million people voted. Whenever information or misinformation like this is used to prove a point or spread to support a point, it undermines the credibility of the speaker and does not do anything to help. In fact, it only makes things worse. Facebook is one of my favorites, though. It's one of the best inventions of this time and one of the worst inventions. It's a good thing because, well, you take, for example, a friend of mine from high school days, Joe Routon and I, we have a lot of fun making funny pictures of each other with Photoshop and sharing those on Facebook. And our family and friends all find that amusing as well. And it's a good way to keep in touch with friends, family, and high school classmates over the years. However, at the same time, Facebook is also very dangerous when it is misused, just as I just talked about with uh, the Georgia slide. Actually spreading misinformation on Facebook is a version of bearing false witness. And we're told in Exodus 20th chapter, verse 16, that we should not bear false witness against our neighbor. Staying with Georgia for a moment, do you remember back in 1996, the Olympics were held in Atlanta? And during that time, a young man named Richard Jewell discovered a backpack left unattended in the parking lot, which he thought might be a bomb. So he alerted the authorities and sure enough, it was a bomb, but they had enough time to evacuate the people so that there was not a loss of life when the bomb exploded. But instead of being the hero, Richard Jewell became the chief suspect for having planted the bomb in order to cash in on the fame for himself. In fact, the networks, most of the major networks, uh, reported that he, they had enough evidence to convict him, but they wanted to make sure before they went to trial. And everybody was rumored and gossiping about Richard Jewell. In fact, it turned out that he was not the person who planted the bomb. That individual was later caught in Murphy, North Carolina, but not before all of this false witness against Richard Jewell had totally destroyed his reputation from which he never really recovered. So I was just using that as an example of how bearing false witness can also have major repercussions in case you don't recognize it, that is one of the Ten Commandments. Let's move on yet again to conspiracies. Everyone has their favorite conspiracy. Uh, it goes all the way back to biblical times. So we find that conspiracies are nothing new. Even in the time of the resurrection of Christ, the first thing that happened was that the government hatched a plan to debunk the fact that Christ rose from the dead. They gave the soldiers a large sum of money telling them to tell the people that the disciples came during the night and stole Jesus' body. And if you get into trouble over this, we will take care of your reputation with the Roman soldiers and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and they did as they were told and they spread that story and it has been circulated among the Jews to this very day. So folks, conspiracies are nothing new. I have relatives in Waverly that think that there was a NASA conspiracy that man actually never landed on the moon. All of those videos that you saw on TV were staged somewhere in Nevada or Idaho and made it look like we were landing on the moon. Other conspiracies abound. At that coffee club, I have two friends there who seriously believe that those jet contrails that we see in the sky when the planes fly over are actually the government spreading chemicals for mind control to make us more compliant with what they want us to do. Whether your favorite conspiracy is the cover up around Bigfoot or UFOs, 
just realize that conspiracies are very easy to come up with. They require no proof and they can be spread again on Facebook or through word of mouth. But again, we are not being honest when we are doing that. How about gun control? Now there's a hot topic. I am again, I'm not taking a position on gun control or not, or modified gun control. What I'm talking about is how we talk to each other around gun control. I have friends who believe so fervently in the second amendment that they get very angry if someone even appears to be taking away their right to bear arms. Other people think that that has been misused and that we should move on to a time where guns are taken away or at least controlled more rigidly than they are now. I couldn't find much in scripture since they didn't have guns back in those days, but I did find one that related to sword control. In Luke, the 22nd chapter, we find that Jesus did instruct them to have a sword. In fact, if they didn't have one to sell their cloak and go and buy one. However, there also seemed to be a limit and a control on how many, because when the disciples said, look, Lord, we have two swords and that's enough, he replied. So although there was the opportunity to own a sword, there was also a limit as to how many should be owned. In those discussions around gun control, as with all other subjects, I come back yet again to our instruction of being kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. So when someone disagrees with you on any of these topics we've covered so far, gun control or any of the others, remember to be kind and loving when we are discussing our differences. Immigration. Is there anyone here who has not been in a discussion around whether we should build the wall between the United States and Mexico, whether our southern border is out of control, whether we are being flooded by all of those immigrants, all of those folks that are coming into our country that we're going to have to take care of. This is another very hot topic with very strongly held positions on both sides. But once again, we need not be angry in discussing our differences. Back in Leviticus in olden times, this was also a problem for Israel as they had foreigners moving into their country. God reminded them that the stranger that dwelleth among them should be unto them as one born among you, and you should love him as yourself. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So we might want to consider not whether we support or or against immigration, but to realize that some of our ancestors were also immigrants. And I understand we want everything to be legal and in order, but I am talking this morning about how we discuss this topic with one another, not about which position we take. This topic of racism is one that I am very sad to discuss. I am sad because I would think that in this day and time, and particularly among Christians, there should be no room for racism at all. And perhaps I could find many, many, many more scriptures, but I have just chosen three to describe that with God, there is no favoritism. All men are created equal in the eyes of God. We may see them as different, but God sees them all as the same. Neither Jew nor Gentile nor Samaritan, all were equal under the law. I grew up in vacation Bible school, perhaps some of you did too, singing a little song called, Jesus loves the little children, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Nowadays, I think that song is probably not politically correct for some reason, although I still like it. I still like the expression, all lives matter but I am told that that is no longer politically correct to say that either. The fact of the matter is that racism is still alive and well, and we should remember to be careful in how we discuss this topic with one another. 
because once again, there are firmly held positions. You know, it occurred to me that there are almost no white people in the Bible. That may be a, a terrible statement to make, but the fact of the matter is that perhaps the closest to that was Cornelius, the first convert, who was an Italian, the Roman soldier. We are told that when we consider these people our enemies, be it race or immigrants or people that just have different opinions than we are, some of us consider them our enemies. Some of those foreign influences we consider our enemies. So we should really distrust them or hate them. But what does the Bible tell us? What is the instruction we have there? Once again, coming from Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, there was a very clear instruction that in the olden times, it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But under Jesus' rule, he was telling them, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That may be very difficult for us at times, particularly when we have very strongly held positions. But the fact of the matter is that we should love our enemies and we actually should be praying for those that persecute us. That is difficult sometimes for us to accept. But they again, consider the source. Ralph did not tell you that this morning. Ralph just reminded you that Jesus told you that. The last topic that I will come to, for me, may be the one that is small in the eyes of men, but not small in the eyes of God. That is the topic of gossip. With God, there are no large sins and no small sins. Sin is just sin. And gossip is certainly listed as among the sins that we should deal with. Although we quite often dismiss it as, well, it's really not that big a deal. But anything that is sin to God is a big deal. When we're engaged in gossip, you might argue with me about what is gossip and what is just sharing information. But I think deep down, we all know the difference. When we get into a discussion that starts off, did you hear about so-and-so and what they did? That very much often leads to gossip. But before we talk about people, I would ask us to stop and think. First of all, is it true? Because if it's not true, then we're back to bearing false witness. Second, is it helpful? Or are we just entertaining ourselves with discussing it? We should be discussing how to be helpful, not all the circumstances and how much better off we are than they are and holier than thou attitude. Is it inspiring? Inspiring, I mean uplifting or helpful, uh, offering hope to those that are having difficulties. Perhaps even more important, is it necessary? Sometimes there's just some things that we just don't need to talk about. It is not necessary to talk about. And the only reason that we are talking about it is to entertain ourselves and to have that superior feeling, that holier than thou, at least I'm not as bad as so-and-so. That is not necessary. And it certainly is not kind. The last thing I would like us to think about. Is it kind or is it just harmful and putting people down to make ourselves feel better? Gossip is clearly in multiple passages pointed out as wrong. I chose one this morning from 1 Timothy, the fifth chapter. This was talking about people who were idle and they were just going about from house to house, not only being idle, but also gossips and busybodies saying what they should not. So again, the clear instruction is not to be idle, busybodies or gossips. And this is coming from scripture, once again, where we should be getting our instruction, not from what we feel is right. I told you that I would mention that fact that there was an inconvenient truth. I know that was the subject of a book written by a famous politician back around 2006. But much before that, I think the Bible contains very, very many inconvenient truths. Perhaps some of you, like me, grew up with the red-letter edition of the Bible. 
you remember those? They had the words of Jesus always showed up in red letters. Well, I've done that on this slide because that's the last slide that I have. And I want to leave us this morning with this particular warning, which came again, not from me, but from Christ himself. Christ said in Matthew, the 12th chapter, but I say unto you that every idle word that man shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. If that warning does not give you pause to reflect on our, some of our discussions with how we talk to one another, with how often we talk to one another about all of these other subjects, then I think we are missing the point. Jesus himself has given us fair warning. We have no excuse. I think we spend, at least I know I spend, way too much time just in idle chit chat back and forth with one another about all the various topics of the day. And I do not spend nearly enough time telling others about the message of Christ and what he has meant to my life. And I think that is our true purpose here on earth. And we sing the song about this earth is not my home, I'm just a passing through. But do we really believe that song or do we actually practice that at all? And in our discussions with one another, remember the song that we sang before the sermon this morning, angry words, oh, let them never from the tongue unbridled slip. We sing those on Sunday, but how often then do we go out Monday through Saturday and have a slew of angry words either in our discussions with one another or on Facebook or some other social media. Folks, this passage is telling us all of those discussions will have to be accounted for at the day of judgment. And so at the end of the day, we're back to where we started. And I would like to leave us this morning once again with our favorite passage, my favorite passage, about being kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. So as we go forth this week, hopefully we have all reviewed some of the ways that we can talk to each other and what the Bible says to us about how we talk to each other. Thank you for your time. Thank you for coming. And we appreciate your being here. Have a good week.